Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, again uh, Alex uh, Yu, uh, who I trust everybody knows has been here on sabbatical uh, uh, for the last several months, and it's just been such a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, everybody will remember that Alex uh, gave a seminar in the fall on flying squirrels and their gut microbiome, and uh, as I said when I introduced him then, uh, he's, he's a, a, a scientist with such broad-ranging interests. He's published on so many different taxonomic groups, and I hope you've gotten a sense of that from his, his last talk and if you've had a chance to interact with him or, or look at his, his papers. But He's, I think of him as a mammologist, but today he's going to talk about birds, and, and he really has done work across many, many different areas. Uh, he's at the National Taiwan University, uh, and I, I should say he's done work across all these different areas, but he came here because he was interested in writing a book on the history of, of science in Taiwan, so uh, really uh, uh, somebody with, with diverse interests. Um, he received his PhD here with Jim Patton. Uh, in 1992, uh, and then went on to postdocs with uh, Chuck Langley at Davis, and then Rebecca Khan, and Rebecca Khan, um, uh, before uh, joining the faculty at National Taiwan uh, University. I don't know, Jim, did you want to say anything about your former <laughs> student? <laughs> I just remember getting this letter in 1984 or 85, you know, from this person who lives in to the west of us, you know, expressing an interest in coming here, and I go, I don't know anything about that part of the world, but sure, why not? And we had a great time together spending a month or so in, in the mountains in central Taiwan during this dissertation research. So, he's the light of my life. You <laughs> <laughs> don't tell Carol. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and today the, the talk is all about birds in Taiwan, so I won't say anything more. And, and Alex, thank you so much for coming and spending your sabbatical with us. It's, it's, personally, it's been a real pleasure, uh, and I'm, I'm just delighted that you chose to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very warm introduction. And I'm certainly, uh, it's certainly a pleasure. It's all mine, you know, being an OMBZ -er, and would be uh, is a Great, great pleasure to come back and to see my major professor actually sitting here and listening to my talk. <laughs> and it's true, he had never set foot west of Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> before he came to Taiwan with me for that field trip. And we had a blast. Uh, the uh, expression I learned. Uh, <laughs> So today I will be talking about the, uh, the birds, and uh, throughout the time I wish I can, I, I hope I can convey the idea how I got into this and how I am trying to get out of it. <laughs> okay, so there are three main scenes of my talk. Whether the first one is cutter, it's about cutter, and the second one is a little bit about what I have done in the last semester, uh, sitting in classes trying to get more idea about doing the history of science. And the last one is, I want to tell you that I, uh, in Taiwan, we have witnessed an event that is the incipient speciation in uh, of, of one of the Taiwanese birds. Okay, so you see, this is the photo when I got here in 1986, but I got married in 1987. And this is my wife, and you can see, and this is me just a few weeks ago in Napa. And you can tell the huge difference <laughs> between my, uh, you know, the hair cutter. And so, uh, so the, the cutter does, on my, of the hair, on my hair, not only shows my physiological condition, <laughs> but also when I, in Taipei, a metro train, somebody, a girl stood up, a school girl stood, stood up and yielded me her seat. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it was shocked for the first time, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden, I realized the color not only shows my physiology, but also have some social implications. 
And in our culture, you know, we have uh, uh, some dramatic uh, uh, play, opera. And uh, you, if you go on the web, you, you're interested in it, and you can see that uh, there's a lot of character, in, and they, they all have facial patterns. And they have uh, not only different colors, but they have different way of apply, different area to apply of, uh, of uh, these colors to the face for the uh, actors to show their personality. And one of those, of course, is the black and white, which is in drastic contrast. And there are two historical characters, and they are being played and, and remembered again and again because they have drastic differences in the face of color and the pattern. <coughs> and this is very common in, in Chinese uh, opera. And nonetheless, in Taiwan, we also have a different uh, variety of this, and we have the puppy show. And in the puppy show, um, actually, we can switch between the two color and show the deer, you know, just a, a variety of this, okay? So, of course, in order for the actors, uh, when you apply this facial uh, plan to your face, of course, normally you don't do that by yourself, because somebody does it for you, right? And you have to know where to put the color and what color to put on where. Okay? And nowadays, of course, sometimes you, have to, you can do it by yourself, with cell phone, you know, mirror or cell phone. But nonetheless, color and the pattern especially play a major role to show uh, a lot of interaction within uh, ourselves and um, across. That, that is definitely true for other animals. <laughs> okay, so, you know, uh, but thinking of this, uh, how much we do know about the, uh, the, the color and, uh, of uh, our hairs, and we don't actually know too much about uh, how they are being produced, and let alone how the pattern of the color are formed in our body parts. And so, in a way, if you think about this, the genome not only provide the, the color, and, but also it's the painter itself, know where and when to express. Okay. Uh, just to recap a little bit, and, um, and also shows how much little knowledge I know about these uh, color, uh, you know, this is the major uh, black and uh, melanin. This is the black color, and it goes through uh, the cell called mel uh, melanocyte, which will produce the melanin. And there are two major, as far as we know so far, two major receptors in the cell, on the cell surface. And one is interacting with agouti, this agouti so associate protein, and this is alpha uh, MSH. I'm sure that you already read a lot about uh, these uh, proteins and uh, controlling the, the color, the melanin production, and the different degree of the color. Um, and this is, this is how it, it interacts in, in the cellular level, and this is how in the molecular level. And I would like to stress that this is pretty much we know. You know, we don't know much more beyond this, as a matter of fact. And then, <coughs> I get to tell you a little bit how I got into bird business, okay. So this is my colleague. Uh, he is uh, a Ming, he is a professor in USC, and he is a dermatologist. And he is so interested in, uh, in uh, you know, all kinds of integumental element of the animal. And he is an MD, and he also has a PhD, but he has a concept of animal. <laughs> and so he said that, uh, and he just highlight those are you know, his domain. And so he is very interested in all, all this. And then, so in other words, he does not confine his organism to just human. He's a dermatologist, the doctor. But actually, most of his work, a lot of significant work, was done with birds, and especially bird uh, feather. And that's how he uh, trying to get me into this. I will, I will show you later. So in his laboratory, they put a lot of effort try to understand the interaction and the uh, uh, the uh, um, developmental pathway and interaction how to get the feather produce the the color and put the color on. Uh, in other words, how do the pen get on the, the feather? And they also spend a lot of time uh, to understand how the feather is actually put out. Okay. And so I would very much like to introduce, I uh, hope that suggests that MBD lunch can invite me to come over to give a talk. I think it will be very enlightening. Okay. 
So what do I do with color? So this is the only thing I do. I have, I have all my research with color, and that's that's it. And it's an old mammal. That's before he, uh, you know, he got me into this, and this only thing I've done. And there's another thing I have to tell you. That's the only thing I have done with birds. And but that is not uh, privately. I told you that. Probably I told you. I'm going to tell you that this. I've done this work in MVZ when I got here, and you know you have to run this uh, sonogram. And it's lucky that uh, I have some. You know, a cohort of a graduate student. You know, we interact a lot. I learned a lot from them. I was able to accomplish this paper, and that's two things: color and bird. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> then I will tell you about a little bit about the, uh, the, the the geography of Taiwan, which has some, many things to do with what we're we're, what we're researching about. And this is the Central Mountain. Okay, go all the way to here. And this is the coastal mountain. And so on, on, on the east side, you've got only a little bit straight of plain. And maybe along the coast, a little bit of plain. And here, I wonder if you have to focus on this here. It's a massive mountain range here. Even though there's a plain here, there's a plain here. But this is a tremendous barrier. And again here, you know, go all the way here. And this is a tremendous barrier over here. But none of that, on the west side of Taiwan, it's a lot of uh, plain and it's all the human activities. And this is what it's like. This is where Jim and I went to, and I, as I show you uh, in my last talk. And uh, <coughs> so I want to stop you just a, mo a moment and say a little bit about what I learned from sitting in the class in last semester. And there are production of knowledge. We scientists hardly think about we are producing knowledge. We are not production, you know, we are doing science. But actually, the social scientists, they think that the production of knowledge, production of science is actually at, at Denver. And you need agency, you need uh, institutions. So here I'm showing all the institutions that participated in our research that I'm going to reveal to you. But let me just tell you, in the 18th century, the geography of Taiwan is being understood like this. This is the Qing Dynasty and the Qing Court, of course, at the time. It is not up to front about these how the, these maps are being. This is they hire they hire the Jesuit priest and to help to draw this map. They also have a lot of knowledge about the geography from the captains of the uh, of the seafarer firing a, a, a merchant ship and so on and so forth. So they draw this map. So you can see that. This is the mountain, as I show you uh, today. And nothing they can put on the other side, because they literally don't know what is behind that. Okay? And so, so that's, it. that's when they put out this map. This is today. Okay? So again, you can see this massive mountain, right? And you can only see a little bit of this, as I show you, and this is a plain over here. And this, this is the mountain here. It's a huge, huge barrier to that. So it hasn't changed. And by seeing a class, I have got the motivation of this, and we know the, the, the big mountain, massive mountain, but we didn't know, didn't show, is this. This is the, again, this is the Qin court. The, the emperor wanted to show his subject what the territory is like. So he asked all the Mandarin in different places. They have to report back what it's like. They have to draw the map. They have to draw uh, what the activity uh, occur on the map. And you can see here, I mean, I, I, I could have given you a more uh, picture of uh, photo, but I, I'm not going to do that because this is the Aborigines and this is the head. So they are drinking from the head of other people. So they are head hunters, and that also explains why they don't know what's behind the mountain. Because there are, you know, these people are very difficult to overcome, and so they don't know what's that in, in behind the mountain. Okay, but nonetheless, they draw this map. Okay, and they don't do map like this. They do map horizontally. And the reason you can see the mountain again, I show you, 
And um, <coughs> the reason is when you are, you're, this is a Chinese settler, settler, you know, the, the emperor, they have a continental centric mind. When they look at Taiwan, they're just like, you know, here, look at this way. So they don't, they don't, they don't, and, and they draw this map, and then they have a lot of detail, you know, all this. And this is quite impressive. And this, you can see the first city in, in, in Taiwan. You see the castle, and you see the wall, and you can see a little bit of the street, you know, uh, in, in the district. So, and this is the south, you know, this is the last I show you the, in the southern tip, there's a barrier over here, and that's it, that's the shop. And but actually on this side, a lot of <coughs> human activity. And then they also show this. These are the Aborigine activity. They are cutting off the, uh, cutting down the uh, coconut. So you see, this is a knowledge, how knowledge is being produced. And they gather this, and the, the, the emperor want to publish this. And you have a book and show all the people about this knowledge. Okay. And then I should, their next two slides should not have shown you if I am a graduate student because we are told not to get off the track, get on focus. <laughs> but I can show you that uh, about these Aborigines, and they actually are being um, studied and saying that the, the, the Taiwanese Aborigine is the sort, ancestral stock of all the Polynesian people. And uh, followed by, uh, by this, this is my colleague in the forest department, and they, uh, because these people, when they go out, they carry this Marlboro <coughs> paper, and uh, you know, they make paper, they make cloths out of the bark, everything, and so he, my colleague uh, he, here, Chong, he used this and to trace this, okay. Again, I showed this, uh, up the track, but I want to show you the knowledge of produced different way today. And it had changed a lot tremendously. So, by telling you all this, this, this unique geography of Taiwan, and in the following, I will argue that <coughs> actually biologists are being affected of this knowledge, and 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 a lot of way they think about their research is preconditioned, more or less. Okay. So this is the bird. Eventually, you come to this bird, and this is the uh, the bubu. Um, this is the white bubuo and this is a black bubuo because they have their head color are very different. And they are very, uh, they're commensable, you know, that they, they like to st stay in the city, stay, hang around with human dwellings, and they can form this kind of uh, congregation. But during the breeding season, they will pair, okay, and they, they, are, they have very good vocalization and they have interesting sound and beautiful sound and people will keep it at that's a cage bird. In the past, we don't do that anymore in Taiwan. People have very high uh, conservation conscious now, and so. But in any case, I want to tell you, they are the house mice of the bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we also know this, you know, when they're young, and what importantly I will show you, when they're they're young, they all have black hat, you know, either uh, color mold. But until in 2017, this is a book, a wild, uh, you know, the field guide of bird of Taiwan. You can see this is a black hat. This is one species being considered endemic. And this is another species. Uh, this is a white hat. And this is, uh, this is being considered a subspecies confined to Taiwan and has a lot of other <coughs> subspecies in other places. So those they are. Not only they're different, and here you can see, watch this, this is an orange dot at the uh, mouse angle. And I started to do research and started to go into the literature, and I can dig out the literature. In 1907, there is an ornithologist and published this paper in IBIS. And he was coming to Taiwan, he was very interested to see these two birds. So specifically, you know, in the old day, when you publish a paper, it's almost like you're taking out from your field note. Right? And there's so much detail. And to tell you, he goes, he describes how he traveled to here, and he only see the white head go to the other, and he, he see the other, the other uh, uh, species. In 1951, and uh, that's it, after war, and the Japanese ornithologists have done so many years of work in Taiwan, so they have to review. They review all the birds in Taiwan, and they describe these two species, and they said that there is a, a hybrid zone here. 
And in that paper, they said that the hybrid dog is with about two kilometers. And also, notably, remember I show you, I, I want you to focus on here, the plant is here, but the mountain is here, but at 1951, they did not see any bubo in that area. In particular, no bubo in this plant, okay? And in 1916, when we started to do this, my graduate student, he went on, he did all this research and uh, survey, and he found out this is what is uh, today's uh, distribution, one hybrid zone here and one hybrid zone there. And we are not the first one or the only one who are interested in studying these two birds. And uh, there are a group of people who are a, a Taiwanese scholar. They study, uh, I think there are about maybe five master students, master thesis, you know, work on this. The problem is they never published their thesis. So then I got into trouble. If I want to publish my stuff, I cannot cite it. Anymore. I cannot <laughs> cite their thesis. But this is also concerning today's production of knowledge. What would you consider the knowledge being produced? It must be in published form or in other format. Okay. And then, nonetheless, I think uh, McKay, he, is, he was a student of Bob Zink. And Bob Zink, you know, is uh, it's an meteor. So somehow, you know, these are all connected together in the small world. And so I, he had, he, they have done the most, uh, McKay had done the most comprehensive study as far as I know. So you can see this is the, uh, the white hat, this is the black hat, and they coincide with the geography I told you. And then um, they treated this as one species and the other subspecies, and so they collected a whole bunch of, of specimen, and they used 10 genes, I think, uh, took out genes, and they do the mitochondria network. If you look at this carefully, you will see that this is the Chinese on the mainland, the white hat. This is southern Chinese, uh, Hainan particularly, the white hat. And this is Taiwanese white hat. And this is the white hat that occur in the Ryukyu, you know, the little tiny islands uh, um, here. Okay? And this is the Taiwanese uh, black hat. Look at this. What would you conclude? Um, if I were them, I would say that, wow, you know, they are the same species, you know. Um, nonetheless, this is what your conclusion. It said that, well, plumage, this is different. Okay, mainland look the same, but Hainan actually look a little bit like that, but not exactly. And this is mitochondrial DNA, as I show you, these are, you know, actually one species, particularly this and this. And then, nuclear DNA, they don't really tell anything, you know. And then, the conclusion is this. This is one subspecies, one subspecies, one sub and this is a distinct species. I would argue, I, when I saw this, I was so puzzled. You know, not only them, but before the, the, the Taiwanese uh, ornithologists, before them, doing all this work, they all have this mindset. This is isolation. There are 440,000, uh, 40, species of, of, of birds of Taiwan, and there's only two show this distinct distribution, so this must be the isolation and which occurred. Um, but when I started to do this, and actually it goes through the master, master thesis, you, you don't, they, don't, they, they don't show that, you know. <laughs> and then, so we have to do our work, so we do started to think, um, you know, we use the specimen, Try to do this work, and we found out that I uh, want to make sure, as a matter of fact, I want to make sure the birds are only different here and here, okay? And so that's pretty much true because, oh, well, this, this doesn't really count, you know, that, uh, but it's just a little bit different from the, from the but otherwise, uh, they're very similar. And as I told you, we are able to differentiate the phenotype in the field, although we are not so sure it is actually hybrid, okay? We just have to. <laughs> Take us back and think what is what is right and what is uh, what is to be found up, found. But now that we went to the hybrid zone, and we look we look at it, we do a bunch of you know four places in the hybrid zone, and then from north to south, and then uh, we look at the phenotype. We don't no longer call them different species phenotype, and this is the breakdown of their frequency, and then we calculate it. I told you the pair. Obviously, conspicuous pairing, so we can do this. And this play, we also look at this, 
and apparently, you know, they are not uh, random mating. You know, they are somehow associated uh, pairing. It's very apparent. And then we got this, and we decided to go on and to do more. So we we uh, come up with this, uh, this design. Have one the female to make the uh, the choices. So we calculate the time span on this bar. Um, as a proof of the, of the, uh, the matrix, okay? So this is the actual, actual uh, situation. And so between the male, two males, we have this black, so they don't see each other. They can hear each other, but they cannot see each other. And this is, uh, you know, the bar from the stand, and this is the verb, and this is the male, male, this is the female. So that's the, how we did this experiment. And this is the result, okay? So it's very obvious that um, they are choosing in favor of their uh, own kind of, of, of head. And at this point, and this is done by me, my collaborator, and he tried to think of mounting evidence so they are the same. And so what else they can do in the, from the perspective of a developmental biologist or cell biologist. So we went along and do, do the DNA seq. So we do this, compare this, this to this, and we also try to compare this to this because we thinking maybe there's some positional effect. And then of course we will compare this and to th this, and it turned out that this is a result. ASIP is agouti, and tyrosine is part of agouti, uh, the melanin uh, material, and this is also part of agouti, uh, a little bit sideways, but it's still belong to this pathway, and this is this, and remember I told you the other possibility is this is the young, and this is a dot, and this young have, you know, and so this is the result. It shows this, you know, but nothing really was novel, right, because it tells us what we already know. Yeah. <laughs> so, the developmental biologist and cell biologist told us a lot, right, and so it's now Boys pass through our hands. What, what we can do to show them? I remember that this is the hybrid zone. So we decided to go into that hybrid zone, collected a whole bunch of hybrid, and we also collected far away from this area, some some white head far away from here, and some um, black head. I want to just point out to you these are the because in Taiwan we have practice called religious. Release, you know, the Buddhism, the Buddhists, they will buy all these white animals being caught, and then they come to a place and release them. And this is what we believe. What happened? Because uh, that, you know, people bought the, the bird here, and they come up here, you know, and then they, they have no sense. They just let it go. So, in 2006, we are able to see here, and people know this for some time, you know. But in general, <coughs> they remain intact. Uh, about in there, throughout their range. You mean it's the pet trade and the Buddhists come, buy the birds, and release them? Uh, it's not a pet trade. It's just a specific trade for this Buddhist release. It's a very, very unique uh, practice, you know. And this not only happened to bird, it especially happened to turtle. You know, we believe turtle is you know, some symbol of longevity, and so you better treat them better or something like that, so you release them, yeah. It is a big problem, but I think it's, the government had put a lot of effort trying to stop this. I think the situation is much improved now. Okay. So again, I told you, uh, despite the case papers, <coughs> show that, you know, these are the, the, the same species, but uh, we have to make sure, double sure. So we do the D loop, we go in, and you can see it, is, and, um, and this is it. Uh, this is black hat, this is the white hat, and the other are just uh, a hybrid. So you see there's no structure at all. They're just the same. But that no structure helped us because we decided to go in and do a GWAS study, uh, catch a whole bunch of uh, hybrid, and uh, you know, as I told you. But the problem is, how do you call the phenotype? Now we get genotype so easy, we don't know. We don't really think too much about phenotype. So this is my training. I'm a scientist. Being trained, you ought to be systematic. Okay, so this is my thinking. From the side, this is from the top, 
and I told you know this is I this is this actually the slide I made to uh, for my uh, I made myself and I told my discuss with my postdoc shall we I will show you uh, she tell her this is all what we ought to do you know and uh, giving her this slide but she didn't like it not at all okay she said that's too complicated okay so you know she she do makeup. She understand what makeup is all about, okay? So she said, we ought to do this and do that. Oh, just reflection of the, the paint being put on the actors, right? And she should talk about, you know, the degree of the melanin, and that's it. And we get the, our, you know, DD, uh, what is that, DD rat, yeah? And that's all we got. This is a goodie, fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. But this new, new gene keep called USP38, and nobody has ever discovered this has anything to do with the color. Okay, and so, and at the time, finally, because the the the, the SNP data, we are able to check on these hybrid, and they are indeed genetic hybrid. Yeah. And then we tell our colleagues. USB 38 is new, and as Ming always pushed me, what is new, what is new? And we are able to show them by evolution genetics or evolution biology do have a, a rabbit to pull out of the hat. Okay. I show this is new, and they go in. They went to, went on and do the experiment. They do this with quail, and they do the uh, Overexpressed by transfect, uh, virus transfection, and they are able to show that when it's overexpressed, and this of USB 38, and it become white. So that shows that this is the proof of the USB 38 involved in the melanin production. Yeah. None of this that doesn't explain why this is coming about, or it doesn't explain how the pattern are applied. But at least we know must be two pathways involved, not just the melanin pathway, the other pathway. And this is ubiquitin uh, specific peptidases until that it's kind of makes sense, right? You have something ubiquitin and you can recruit it to do something for you and show this pattern. And there's some kind of interaction we don't understand, but that makes sense. So where do we go from there? And then we decided to go to check the chromosome 20, this is the a, uh, SIP, the Aguti, and this is the uh, chromosome, this is the USP38, and we decided to check for repeat landscape. Um, so this is zebra finch, great, great tip. Um, we do our assembly based on this, so we rely a lot on this. Annotation of Corky has to go back and probably originally coming from the chicken. And you can see that Bubu has very different uh, repeat landscape uh, than it or finch, and we just look at the USB 38 region. You know, this is fairly different here. So we're trying to see if we can find some evidence this viral infection, which is part of the uh, transporter element, and could have caused the switch of the expression pattern, and that would turn out to make the difference in the head color. And we also continue on uh, with that. Uh, well, I have no solid data to show you at this point. And finally, I want to tell you again what I was trying to tell you. First of all, color, we don't know much. Um, second, production of knowledge, it's important. And the way we consider and ponder upon the scientific questions depends on, on the <coughs> different ways of knowledge production. And finally, I hope you will take up your, your uh, go away with this idea there is an incipient speciation of birth in Taiwan. And once again, these are the agencies in this production of knowledge. Uh, Ming is from USC. Uh, this is institution is new to Taiwan. Um, after a lot of effort to uh, study native animal and put a lot, a lot of effort to uh, focus on the conservation issues, 
and a colleague there, a uh, good friend, and he is a Yao, he is a very good uh, onisologist, field onisologist, and he gave me a lot of support. Um, I joined them in every single collecting trip uh, with them, I collected all the samples uh, together with them. And NHRI, and I have a former student who is a research faculty there, and he, is, he helped us with his genome you know, analysis. And this is the Department of Agronomy, and they help us with all the GWAS work. And finally, this is my lab. Zhao Wei is my postdoc, and this is myself. And I only said these people because although we have agency, we have institution, there are people who are really sitting behind the whole project trying to push it forward. And I'm very happy I was one of those. And I should have thanked all the people who participated in this project, and there are about maybe three um, dozen of them, you know, all kinds, all levels. And I wish that when I finish the project, I would be able to take photo of everybody's facial vision, <laughs> just like this. <laughs> this is the Bubu family, um, a lot of, um, they all, by the way, they all have black pigments somehow on the head. So I think there may be some kind of adaptive value just putting a lot of pigments uh, uh, on your head. Yeah, that's a bird. <laughs> so that's it.